Hi, my name is Gordy Hogue, and this is Community Connection. Each of us have stories, stories that help us understand each other and help to bring our community closer together. I have been very fortunate to have met many interesting people. People who've had a positive, profound impact on our community and far beyond. People who've had incredible life experiences and fascinating stories. Community Connections is about these people and about their stories. I'm sure you'll enjoy meeting these amazing people as much as I have. Thank you. Please enjoy. Welcome to Community Connections. My name is Gordy Hogue, and I'm delighted with today to have as our guest today, someone who came to White Rock and attended White Rock Elementary School in grade five. He graduated from Samiamu High School and was, as an alumnus, was chair of the Alumni Association. He was for 32 years a volunteer firefighter in White Rock, past president of the South Surrey White Rock Chamber of Commerce, a director on the business improvement area, president of the White Rock Museum and Archives Society, and he is a recipient of the City of White Rock Community Builders Award. I am delighted to have Terry Ross as our guest today. Welcome, Terry. Thanks, Gordy. Thanks for having me on. And uh, just to make one minor correction to what you said, I started at White Rock Elementary in grade four. Oh, you were a year earlier than I thought. <laughs> in that little old school that we had there in those days. Yeah, that's the one. It's the dirt playground and nothing, nothing to do at lunch hour but play in the dirt and bat a ball around. Then we had Jesse Lee taught there at that time. And yeah, and Mrs. Stevenson, Stevenson. and uh, Mrs. Schroeder and Miss Campbell. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Was a, that was a quite a time in those days, and as you say, in the, the muddy playground. So you were you were born in Winnipeg. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you your journey to to this community? Uh, yeah, born in Winnipeg uh, in Misericordia Hospital and uh, was in Winnipeg, actually in St. James, which is just outside of Winnipeg, that's where I live. Basically, I lived with my grandparents. My mother and father got divorced when I was quite young, so I lived with my grandparents. And then in uh, when I was in grade two, uh, my grandfather retired from Deer Lodge Hospital. And decided he wanted to move out here to BC where my mother was already living. So that's when we loaded everything in the car and, and trekked out here to, to BC. And basically through that time, I lived partly with my mother. Uh, my father was also in Vancouver by that time, but um, primarily lived with my grandparents down near the corner of State and Thrift. And then you started school in, in grade four and uh, progress through that and then talk a little bit about uh, some of your memories from uh, going to school and playing in the summer and how you connected with people in that fashion. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in school, we're talking a lot of years ago, so it's uh, some of the memories are <laughs> a little more distant, but uh, I remember being the milk monitor, getting out of uh, class 10 minutes early at lunchtime so I could go down and help uh, bring up the milk to class. Uh, and then, uh, you know, once you had your lunch, it was run outside and try to run down to the baseball diamond as you ran across home plate that decided what position you played in the in the baseball game over lunch hour. So I always tried to get down because you, you did want to be a batter. I mean, you really didn't want to be out in the hay, uh, you know, 10th in the hay, man, you probably weren't going to be able to uh, play much basketball, uh, much baseball during the uh, lunch as far as hitting or running or anything like that. But yeah, it was a, you know, a gravel, rocky field, that's for sure. And that was with the, the old, the old, old part of the school. And then eventually the newer wing got built in the front, uh, which was uh, fantastic and modern and dry. And, and I actually had a, a basement you could play in at lunchtime if it was raining. So that was a big improvement over being out in the rocks and the mud. I remember it was Mr. Beasley, I think, was the, the man who handled the, the milk. And you went down, as you say, because I think I did that milk monitor for a while where you go down and get the little bottles of milk to bring up to class. Chocolate and white milk, I think they had in those days. Yeah, they frowned on you having chocolate, but I like the chocolate milk. So that's uh, typically what I got. But I think, you know, when I went down there, it was about 10 bottles of white milk to one bottle of chocolate that you got brought back up. Yeah, I remember Mrs. Lee was, uh, was my teacher one year and she gave the lecture on how we should order white milk, not chocolate. And I think I was the only one that ordered chocolate, much to her dismay. <laughs> so 
So did you spend a lot yeah. of time at the beach in those days during the summer as well? Uh, not a lot. Like I said, we lived uh, thrift and state, so it wasn't exactly just a, you know, a two minute walk to the beach from there. But uh, yeah, I spent some time down there and walking on the pier and uh, some time at the old library right at the end of the pier there. I was you know, quite into books and, and reading and whatnot. So I'd go there and, you know, every two weeks you'd be able to get some new books. So that was certainly a, a stop along the way. But yeah, walked on the pier, all that kind of stuff, you bet. When, when did you develop your fascination with uh, photography and with cameras and all of that uh, interest? Well, I, I always was interested in photography. It, it kind of gelled a little more when I got into high school and I joined the photography club and uh, got you know around people who were also interested in cameras. And by that time I could afford to buy a, a little better camera than what I had. It wasn't just a, a box brown anymore. I bought a from Sears, a Tower 35 it was called. Ooh. And uh, that you know leaps and bounds of better pictures than what I what I had been taking. Still couldn't afford much film and getting it developed, but you know I, at least I could go out and take some pictures and, and whatnot. And that kind of progressed from there that uh, always was interested in photography. And right through high school, stayed um, you know interested. When I got out of high school, uh, I worked for um, Air Canada for a little while. And then I got a job with a company called Frederick Photography in Vancouver doing portraits. But it was portraits where you went to people's houses. Yeah. So they would give you in the morning a sheet and you would have to get to these houses and take people's pictures. So you had to set up something in their house with some portable lights that you had and a big old uh, camera with a, a film uh, back on it and try to figure out how to take the best uh, picture of these people. And, you know, you never knew what you're walking into. It could be a, a senior citizen. Uh, it could be six little kids running around. Uh, I took pictures of a horse once out in the barn. Uh, you just never knew from day to day what you were going to get. And uh, that was quite a challenge. And you had, on an average day, you probably did 10 houses. And then as it got closer to Christmas time or things like that, you were booked basically from sunrise to sunset and all day Saturday as well. So you, you really had to hustle to get all the pictures in and every morning deliver them back to Vancouver so they could process the film and, and get the, uh, the pictures flowing. So really indoctrinated into photography, particularly portrait photography at that particular point in time. And then I got um, into the White Rock Photography Club and uh, worked uh, with them for several years. Uh, that was when it was above Midway Motors. Oh, yeah. And uh, I was president of that club for a couple of years. And then eventually it kind of it sort of disbanded, sort of joined with the Crescent Beach Club. And I've worked with the Crescent Beach Club over the years as an honorary member and been down several times to uh, you know, various presentations with them. I probably would have stayed more with the club, except that to tell you the truth, when you work in photography all day, and then you try to do some of your, your own photography, you know, on your own time, you kind of have enough photography without going to meetings about it. But I did try to keep in and give them a, you know, a hand whenever I could. And then you got into working at Reed's Photoshop. And... Yeah, that's right. Uh, I got in working there and, uh, I was there for 42 years altogether. Yeah. Started out as a basically a counter in the back of uh, Reed's Western Drugs, it was called at the time. And kind of built that up and we moved it up to the front of the store and expanded it to the, what we call the camera corral at that point in time. And that expanded till we kind of ran out of room. So uh, we split the, uh, the business off into a store that's uh, at the end of Central Plaza. We call it Photo Mart. And that was where the um, TD Bank is now. And we ran that for several years there. And then the opening came to where it ended up being uh, back along the main part of the plaza, uh, still called Photomart. And then we got in, I got involved with a group called Photosource um, and decided that it would be a good move for us to become part of that group. It's all independent members. Uh, so we didn't lose any independence or anything like that, but we now had buying power. We now had uh, resources. Uh, we had AGMs to go to and meetings and whatnot, and it really expanded what we what we could do uh, at, at that point in time. We ended up being the first Western uh, Canada member for 
photo source. Uh, primarily at that time, it was back in Ontario and a little bit in the Maritimes. Um, I got to know a couple of the people from the, uh, from the group and they persuaded me that I should be a member. So like I say, we became the first Western member, uh, followed shortly after that by a few others that I'd been associating with here. I'd formed a, a little group here on our own, uh, called Independent Photo Retailers of BC. So we kind of moved that into Photosource Canada. It ended up that Photosource Canada um, is still in operation, although it's a much smaller operation than it was, as you can imagine, with, with most camera stores. There was at the, uh, the prime time, which was about five or six years ago, there was 260 stores in the group across Canada, uh, based out of Oakville, Ontario. I uh, got involved with the board of directors there and uh, got into the marketing committee. And eventually I was the chair of the marketing committee. So I was kind of responsible for marketing across Canada for the group. Um, we had a head office with four or five people and they were doing the day-to-day -day work. But the, uh, as, part, as chair of the marketing board, I was one that was looking over things for flyers and all that kind of stuff. So I had the responsibility for, for a lot of members. So you're saying that and, the leadership for Canada in many ways came right out of South Surrey White Rock and the provision you were providing for that. That's right. And then as I, they decided that, or somebody decided that I should uh, then take on the job as chairman of the board for the whole group. So I went on to the board to learn for a couple of uh, years what that was all about. And then I did become a chairman of the board for Photosource Canada. So I was heading back and forth to Oakville. I lost track somewhere over 60 trips to Oakville wow. uh, over the years. Um, so so wh where did you meet your, your wife, Carolyn? How did, the, how did that go with uh, you traveling so much and being involved in well, that, we, having a family and three children? Yeah. We've been married since uh, 1966. So you can do the math on that. Just you know, put it down as equals long time. <laughs> uh, we actually met in Birch Bay, uh, roller skating. Oh. Uh, Carol was born in Powell River and her family lived in several places, including in White Rock. They had a little party store here at one time, way back on Johnson Road, party supplies. And her mother was American. Uh, so they had moved down to, to Blaine and she was going roller skating in Birch Bay. And at that time, uh, myself and a group of other guys we always used to go down to birch bay roller skating on saturday night i can so remember I doing that there. myself yeah yeah right on the waterfront yeah that's right so we went together for about a year and a half and decided well this is uh, a lot of trips back and forth across the border uh we knew every customs agent at the border because we used to go down and pick her up not much doing blaine so we'd come back here we'd go to a drive-in or we do you know go for something to eat or whatever so uh, basically, by the end, the customs officer just kind of, oh, go on, <laughs> go through. <laughs> and we ended up uh, getting married in Birch Bay um, at the little uh, church down there. And the reason for that, two things. One, she was living down there and she had family down there. Second part was that uh, we decided that we'd like to have our anniversary together all the time. So we had our wedding on July 1st. It was very difficult to get a place up here to get married on July 1st, but down there, of course, not a holiday. So uh, that's why we ended up getting married July 1st in, in Birch Bay. And uh, she moved up here immediately. We lived on High Street to start with. Uh, beautiful view out over the water and all that kind of stuff. And then we moved down to uh, Crescent Beach, the end of uh, 128th Street, uh, in a house owned by Bill Hastings. I'm sure you know oh, Bill. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. Photographer. He my, yeah, he was my landlord uh -huh. uh, living next door. And I used to go down and help him in his basement, slosh through some prints through the chemistry and whatnot. And, and then eventually we bought a mobile home. Oh. We bought a mobile home in Breakaway Bays. We lived there for a few years and then bought a house up on 24th Avenue, 24th and 140th. And current. And after that, we moved to the house that we're currently in, which is right near Samuel High School, uh, across the road from it, basically. And your your children have actively been involved in the community, just as you and Carol have. Can you talk a little bit about them? Yeah, I have uh, one boy and two girls. Uh, they were all went to semi and graduated the same as I did from there. So I was just telling my pictures on the wall. They're looking down at you so you can you know, behave kind of thing. <laughs> uh, 
but yes, we've they all went through the music program primarily. Uh, primarily, uh, my uh, oldest daughter and my son. My uh, youngest daughter was in the music program, but not quite as involved. And my wife Carol was president of the music society for a number of years. So she would take the little darlings on trips to various places around the country and down to Cuba one time and lots of times to Disneyland and uh, all these places. So we've always been involved through the, through the school, that's for sure. And as you mentioned in the intro there, I was uh, on the alumni society for a long time and uh, tried to get a little more going there. Um, and we had a couple of reunions and I still kind of keep my hand in on some of the individual re reunions going on and help out where we can. I do have material and backup um, files and whatnot here if anybody needs them for a reunion that they're putting on. Not that there's been any in the last few months. No. And there's none planned that I know of right now, uh, but uh, hopefully they'll, they'll start up again soon. And I think uh, actually Bernard Charles and I had started the Alumni Association that uh, we had been talked to. And I think Bernard and I put up the money to get it started. And so it's great to see that it went quite well. And I think that it still comes in and out and has different levels of participation at different points in time. Yeah, some some classes are certainly one to participate. Other classes, not so much, particularly the newer classes that all those kids keep in touch on Facebook and all these things. So <laughs> it's not as critical for them to get together. It's not like uh, they haven't seen each other in 30 or 40 years, something like that. So the newer graduates tend to do something on their own. It's typically the ones that are like 25 years or more since they graduated that, that want to get together. So with all of this involvement you've had in the community over so many years and participating and documenting things, photography, uh, it seems kind of logical that you're now uh, president of the museum and archives and uh, being able to have that sense together and a sense of the community and, and the history of our community. So, so what, uh, what, are, what do you see the role of the museum and archives in sort of protecting our history and, and uh, trying to bring life to it and offering different uh, exhibitions to, to teach people about our community and, and our connectedness? Yeah, we've been really lucky that the city has supported the museum uh, very well through the years. Uh, in, in information, but also just in a place to have the museum and repairs. They've just uh, this year put all new windows in the museum for us and they're painting the museum. And they always come down right away if there's a problem with the air conditioning or whatever. So they've been very supportive. Uh, we're trying to document everything that happens. Even now they're out documenting some of the, uh, the results of the COVID and whatnot. Uh, and going back through the stuff, trying to figure out what's important. There, there's an awful lot of stuff in the filed away in the archives and in storage. And some of it, truthfully, isn't relevant to White Rock at all. Uh, it's been donated through the years out of the kindness and the goodness of hearts of people, but it doesn't really fit in with White Rock. So we're trying to go through some of that and just make sure that everything that we have is relevant. Uh, we have a new curator down there uh, who is uh, doing an excellent job of all that. We've also, just in the process, uh, next week is a board meeting for the museum of getting approval to buy a large flatbed scanner uh, for the museum that'll be able to do like a full newspaper page at one time or some of the big old maps and big old documents and things like that. So this stuff can be scanned and eventually it'll be up online for people to, to look at and, and research and whatnot. Right now, anything like that that we have to do, we have to uh, beg, borrow, or steal some time from like the Surrey Museum or someplace else to, to use their scanners. So this will be a big boost to uh, you down there to be able to do this stuff right, right then and there. Or if somebody brings something in that doesn't want to leave it, we can scan it right away and, and have it in the archives. So uh, last year, put in all new computers down there. Uh, the computers we had before, uh, a pencil worked faster. So now we uh, have some new computers and cloud storage and backup for everything. And that's been a big uh, boost too to, to productivity down there. Uh, before, you know, you literally turned on the computer, went for coffee, came back, oh, it's still not ready to go, <laughs> have a second cup of coffee <laughs> and then start up. So this is, uh, I'm told is a big boost down there to that. So trying to work on a lot of that just to bring the, the, the baseline of the museum up to make sure that we can capture everything that's happening now. 
and at the same time go back into history and make sure what we have is is relevant and whatever. Uh, I've certainly been working with um, Samyama First Nations on some of their stuff. Uh, we've started a reconciliation ceremony uh, with them, which we had the first part uh, last year. And Hugh has been getting out and doing some uh, interviews around town and walks around town. He'll be doing some of those. Uh, we've just acquired some photo equipment, ta-da, for the museum. Uh, so that uh, he can do videos similar to what you're doing right now, go out and interview some of the people who have been relevant to White Rock and to the museum over the years, and and again get those into the archives. So yeah, lots going on down there. I, I remember uh, in reading the goal of the museum and archives, and and I think that the overall goal was to uh, to interpret local history and and challenge visitors to think about the future as well as the past. So what, what do you think about, when, as you look at the, the past of our community, how is that informing our future? And uh, how do you see, what, where do you see the future based on the foundation that's been set with the, the past and the work that the museum and archives has done? Boy, we're getting into some deep stuff here. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that is the role of the museum to document all this stuff and make it accessible and hopefully we learn from the past. Uh, hopefully we look back on things that happened in the past. And hopefully those helps us with decisions and challenges that we may face today or in the future. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's happened here that really nobody knows about. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is to document all that stuff, but also present it in a way that's easy to understand. We are going out, we have over the last, last number of years gone out to school classrooms. And we do teaching within the classrooms of the, you know, some of the more basic stuff, but where did, why did White Rock start? Who was here? Uh, about the Samyamu First Nations, of course. Uh, about the train coming through. Why was the train put here? Why is the train still here? Uh, all these kind of things. So that's going out into the education world. And again, that's been kind of put on hold because of COVID, but that's something that we're planning on expanding on um, as time goes on to bring the history to the present. Yeah. And you have some uh, permanent exhibits as well that uh, that exist in the in the museum, the uh, City by the Salish Sea, and the, the talk about that. And uh, certainly yeah, we certainly do. We have uh, permanent exhibits of uh, in the uh, the old station itself uh, of where the um, telegraph operator was and uh, Sid Beals and all these people that, that, that were down there. there. And that stays all the time and we're hoping to enhance that this year or as soon as we can uh, with more background sounds of trains and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the other exhibits uh, that are rotating through the gallery, uh, right now we're starting out with one it, as we're recording this, it's the end of October. Uh, Remembrance Day is coming up and we have our Lest We Forget uh, gallery, which is open now. And that will be open through to uh, sometime in uh, December, I forget the exact date. Uh, we normally have a Christmas uh, uh, sort of trade show fair for people or vendors to come in, uh, but because of COVID it's been canceled this year. So that's kind of a blow to us because it was a good money raiser for us. And it also allowed that these vendors with their crafts, arts and crafts had a place to sell their stuff and they won't be able to do that this year. We're trying to work on a little modified one that maybe we can have a few people in, but the present time we won't be having it like we we normally do so we're, we're transitioning at the museum and partly you know this covid thing is, is certainly bad but in the other ways it's made us look to what we are doing and how can we be relevant in this time and how can we be relevant once this time is over and this recording of of these video recordings that we have time to do now that we didn't really have time to do before uh upgrading all these uh, the building and all that which we really didn't have time for before we've now been able to do so we're going to come out of this i think really good it's just too bad we have to go through this particular time to get there i noticed that uh you, you made reference to go, going out to some of the schools and talking to some of the the students there but i also noticed that you've got uh, a number of uh, displays for children so they coming into the museum and places that are interactive for them to to get a sense of, of history and grounding and and understanding of our community from a, a very basic level at the museum. Yes, that's right. We, we wanted a place where children could kind of play a little bit while the parents took the time to, to read the signage and, and look at the exhibits and all that. So yeah, we do 
try to uh, entertain the, the kids a little bit so their parents have time to, to learn about the history of White Rock and whatnot. So if you were to, uh, to, to look at or have a, a message, what, what are the things that for your long time in the community that kind of stand out for you as, as pivotal moments in the history and development of our community? Boy, there's been so many. You know, one thing we, we didn't touch on uh, was that for 32 years, I was a volunteer firefighter here. I did mention that, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that, uh, you know, during that time, I was involved in a lot of charity stuff and whatever. But you also got to meet a lot of people, sometimes not under the best circumstances. Yeah. But it it was a real eye-opening time. And I kind of, I called it my secret life because, <laughs> you know, people would see me during the day at, at the store and then at night at three o'clock in the morning, I'd come into their house with a hose in my hand to put out a burning pot on the stove. Funny, they wouldn't recognize me. <laughs> Strange. So, yeah. So you saw people in a whole different way. Um, you know, I think through the time, I think the city has, and, and I guess depending on how you look at it, the city has grown. And for some people that's good and some people that's bad. Um, I don't think anybody says 100% that it was good. I don't think anybody says 100% it was bad. It does help having more people around to be able to uh, facilitate more projects and things. I see that through the uh, Business Improvement Association that I'm on the board of. Uh, the more business we have here, the, the more levy money we can collect to put back into the business, to put on things like concerts for the pier, and buskers festivals and all these things. So having more people in more places is good for that. But I also understand that, you know, we've lost a little bit of the, the hometown feel. Uh, I don't think anybody goes down and collects milk at the school anymore for, for lunch <laughs> hours. <you know? laughs> uh, so there, there's been good and bad all through the years. Uh, but I think overall, you know, when we travel and Carol and I have been lucky enough to travel quite a bit, um, it's White Rock gets a pretty positive review. Uh, we were down in um, um, Cancun at a resort and just walking along and there was a, one of the girls that was there that was a server was walking beside us and you know you just get casually talking to her and and uh, we she asked where we we're from and I said well we're from British Columbia. Oh she said well, whereabouts? Well, it was just outside of Vancouver. Oh outside well whereabouts? And I said well White Rock. Oh, White Rock, I've been there. They've got a great pier there. I really enjoy it on the being on the beach. And here's somebody, for, you know, working in a resort that you didn't expect you would have traveled that far. And, you know, whether we've traveled, we've, we've been, like I say, to Cuba and St. Kitts and all kinds of places like that. Anybody that knows White Rock always gets a, a positive rating. I've also been lucky enough to travel quite extensively across Canada through uh, Photosource. Um, Everything from Bedeck in Nova Scotia to Montreal to Halifax, uh, Saint Adele in Quebec, whatever, and you know almost everybody's heard of White Rock, and almost everybody says what a great place. Either they've been here, or they know somebody that's been here, or they would like to come here. But whatever it is, White Rock gets top marks all the time. I've never heard anybody say, "Oh, White Rock, what a dump! I wouldn't want to live there." No, we've been pretty blessed uh, to grow up in this community and be a part of this community. And certainly uh, a lot of the, the positivity comes from people like you and the contributions that you've made uh, over the years to, to the well-being of the community. Because it's not just the physical presence, it's, it's the feeling. And you reference that with uh, many, of the, uh, many of the volunteer roles you've played. And currently with respect to making sure our history is preserved for the museum and archives and that that, that sense of social well-being that is such an important part of creating community. And you've done a great job with that. Do you have any, uh, any final comments you'd have for as we look off into the future and what we should be holding on to and what the future might bring to our community? Well, uh, you know, right now it's hard to predict the future. Uh, I'm not even sure what I'm doing this afternoon, except <laughs> I do have to rake some leaves. <laughs> yeah, lots of leaves, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, who who can predict right now what, what it's going to look like a few months or a few years from now? So at the museum, what we're trying to do is preserve today uh, so that it's here for the future. But as to predict what the future is going to happen, 
that's a tough one. And if you can do that, or you know anybody that can predict the future, I would really like to meet up with them. Well, I, I think for me, it's it's about it's about ensuring that the values that you've reflected, the values that you've commented on, the values that people bring to the community and their contributions, and uh, the great sense of, of volunteerism that exists in the community and has for I think since the growth of the community and since the, its, its inception, I think those values need to be, we need to continue to nurture and support those. And then if, if we have those strong values, I think the growth of our community will be in good hands and, it, and will, will do us all and serve us all well. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, and you know, the arts community is big here. Um, There's so many people here that are involved in, as you say, in volunteerism and you know, it's great. I, I've been in a bunch of these groups and I've, you don't really see anybody saying I'm in it for me. What can I get out of this? It's all about what I, what can I do for the community? And that's, it makes it so much nicer to work with people like that. And everybody jumps in and says, yes, I can help you with that. Yes, I can do that for you. Yes, I can try to get that funding. I can do whatever. And that's been, uh, it's marvelous, really. Well, that's a wonderful way to to end our discussion, talking about the positivity of the, of the community and the people here, and we have to be blessed in a pretty nice looking place too. Thank you very much. And, and of course, and of course, you've done your part too. So I do want to commend you for all that you've done. And I don't know how you're going to do a self interview, but you should do that one day and talk about yourself and and all the things that you've contributed and all the volunteer things you've done and. I know through the years, almost every meeting I've gone to, or every volunteer organization, uh, Gordy Hoag is there as the speaker, as as uh, you know, helper, whatever. So, you know, look in a mirror, give yourself a, a little interview. Do that. I've been. I feel very blessed, as I think we all have, who have grown up in this community and have come to it, and look forward to to a continued growth and a good continued sense of those values. Thank you, Terry, for all that you and your family have done for this community in so many ways. It's much appreciated. Thank you for joining us today on Community Connections. Please tune in to our next show as more amazing people share their wonderful stories. If you haven't already, please click on the red subscribe button below, right down there, and view our updates. Feel free to leave any thoughts or comments that you may have. We're always trying to do a better job of connecting this wonderful community. Thanks again for joining, and until next time, keep connecting. Thank you.